Hey, what's up, Brainiacs? This is Dwight here with you for The Broken Brain, except this is also (laughs) not The Broken Brain. I am uh, playing a sample, as I do sometimes. I like to highlight creators, and with this being the tail end of Black History Month, I also wanted to promote a black artist or creator. You've heard me plug uh, Daryl Mansell's movie reviews and movie and fandom programs before, and uh, Daryl gave me permission to share a copy of his movie review from his podcast, Paprika Reviews. They have some long episodes with deep dives into film. They have a show where they compare uh, remakes with the originals. Just all sorts of really cool things over there. You can also uh, check out the Facebook group, Paprika, on Facebook. That's P-O-P-R-I-K-A. Like, paprika is a spice, right? But this is pop culture, too. So there you go. You can put those together, and that's what you got. So uh, Daryl, who goes by the the nickname Seed, and a lot of his reviews and such, is given, he's given me permission to share this review of Ant-Man Quantum Media. Oh, and hey, just for fun, let me also highlight a couple of other podcasts that I love, created and hosted by Black Individuals. Uh, Vega, a sci-fi adventure podcast, is a fictional science fiction story about a bounty hunter uh, in the future sci-fi world. Ivoma Hall is the host and creator of that, and you can hear uh, her stories there, and it leads to lots of different things you can do to support her art and her work. Maximum Film, another one of my favorite podcasts about movies, hosted by Ify Nwadwe. You should definitely be listening to that if you're into movies. And lastly, uh, Michael Harriet is a writer who you may follow on Twitter or you may have read his stuff online. He also has a podcast uh, for the Grio Network, all about race relations, uh, racism, and a lot of very interesting uh, stories about history. You should go and listen to the ones he's been doing all this month about South Carolina and how a majority black population uh, following the Civil War actually implemented a lot of political successes and things that we still hold to and depend on today. You should uh, check it out. That podcast is called The Grio Daily. Uh, that's uh, one word, T-H-E-G-R-I-O, The Grio Daily. And he releases a few minutes every day, which is uh, pretty cool. All right, take it away, Daryl. What is going on, gang? It's me, your boy C, the host. Most of the things right here on Pavarica. We're back with yet another review for you today. Today we're talking Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Directed by Peyton Reed, starring Paul Rudd, Evangeline Lilly, Michelle Pfeiffer, Catherine Newton, Jonathan Majors, and others have been there as well. Uh, let's get right into it, man. Let's get into this Ant-Man shit. Everything is going great in Scott Lang's world. He's a successful author. He's Had his relationship with Hope Van Dyne. His bond with his daughter couldn't be stronger. All of that changes when the three of them, along with Janet Van Dyne and Hank Pym, are transported to the Quantum Realm, taking him on an adventure that has them facing off against their most dangerous opponent yet. In Condomania, Peyton Reed is the first MCU director to take a character, almost, he's the second MCU director to take a character through a full trilogy. Shout out goes to John Watts for the Spider-Man trilogy. With Ant-Man, Reed and his team crafted a simple heist film, uh, a construct that worked famously within the confines of that shared universe. Ant-Man and the Wasp expanded the scope of Scott's world, giving viewers a Ferris Bueller-style adventure comedy focused on rescuing Janet Van Dyne from the quantum realm. With Quantumania, the smaller, more character-focused storytelling has largely been traded in for a wide-ranging, consequence-heavy epic that feels out of step with its previous outings. Uh, you know, gone are the good-natured antics and warmth of the X-Con gang. They're not in this movie. Uh, replaced by, you know underdeveloped band of freedom fighters who have some intermittent screen time. The tone of the Ant-Man franchise, the foolish absurdity that Paul Rudd has made his bread and butter over the decades quickly dissipates in the film's opening act and is replaced by jokes that land at an inconsistent rate and cameos that ultimately amount to nothing. They're written by 
Rick and Morty writer Jeff Loveness, the overall issue of Quantumania lies in the story, I think. If the purpose of the story is to introduce Kang the Conqueror as the next overarching villain of the MCU, the ball was a little bit fumbled here. With Kang, well, he's an undeniable threat. He doesn't feel like an Avengers-level threat during or after the events of this movie. While the post credit scenes do a little bit more to push the narrative, the movie itself fails at establishing Kang as a worthy menace, never fully revealing his overall goal outside of Escape the Quantum Realm. The multiverse saga was teased and set up throughout Phase 4, doing double duty as something as a, a denouement from the Infinity Saga, but after the events of Spider-Man No Way Home and Loki and Doctor Strange, the multiverse of badness, audiences were posed to delve fully into the multiverse and Kang's tyrannical reign upon it, but unfortunately, no such thing happens in Quantumania, continuing to leave audiences in the dark about what's coming or anyone's role in it, with the exception of Sylvia. She very clearly defined her role in that last episode of Loki. It's this lack of clear definition that may leave some lukewarm on the run-up to 2025's Kang Dynasty, a movie that Loveness is also the writer of. Starring Paul Rudd, Quantumania takes the time to explore the relationship between Scott Lang and his daughter Cassie. The overall theme and the strongest through line of the trilogy has been Scott's love for his daughter and this movie continues it. Rudd and Catherine Newton have some excellent chemistry together I think. Typically typically, the happy-go-lucky Avenger Rudd is able to expand a bit thanks to the more dramatic elements of this film. In these scenes Rudd as an actor who's proven that he can be just as good dramatically as he can comedically he handles these with ease. Uh, the decision to fixate on Scott and Cassie's relationship comes at the detriment of almost every other character on screen, save Kang, maybe. Hank Pym, once again played beautifully by the seemingly perennially cantankerous Michael Douglas, has woeful little to do in this movie, relegated to the background throughout the majority of its runtime. Um... The same can be said for Evangeline Lilly as the Wasp as well, hanging back and serving little purpose other than to ask the questions that the audience is already thinking. And while the relationship between uh, Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne was fractured between the first two Ant-Man movies, time has managed to heal all wounds between the two here. Rudd and Lilly are always great together, with Lilly's no-nonsense nature counterbalancing Rudd's goofiness perfectly. With Quantum Mania, however, audiences don't get much interaction between the characters. Eventually, Lily is fine in the role, but sadly, it's given she's given little to do outside of one fairly major scene. Uh, with Michelle Pfeiffer, man, basically teased in the last minutes of Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uh, she comes to the forefront here in Quantumania as the audience's guide through this strange world, and Pfeiffer carries the weight in the movie as Janet Van Dyne navigates the heroes through the terrain while providing the necessary backstory on Kang. Her agency in the movie cannot be denied, and while she takes a step back uh, you know, in the film later as it goes on, you know, when Kang and Lang square off, she dominates the first half. Jonathan Majors is Kang. A complete 180 turnaround from the character you played in that last episode of Loki. This iteration of the character is as ruthless as he is cunning. Physically, Majors takes up space on the screen, and while he's roughly the same height as Rudd, it's Majors' presence that makes him seem larger than he is. The first of two antagonistic roles this year, Quantumanium shows that while he is up to the task, the script and the story don't rise to his skill set. Uh, Majors is fascinating on the screen. Kang, the Conqueror, doesn't fully reach the expectations levied upon him by producer Kevin Feige. The most disappointing element of this film to me is Modoc, the mechanism, the mechanized organism designed only for killing. While impressive visually and voice acted well enough by Ant-Man returnee Corey Stoll, that arc that began for Darren Cross in the first movie sees a limp and unsatisfying conclusion here. Sprinkled throughout the film generously, a lot of the jokes designed for or surrounding him fall flat in a way that can't help but be reminiscent of Thor Love and Thunder. Peyton Reed's ambition has to be admired as a director. Uh, with some of the best visual effects since the MCU has entered the multiverse saga, Quantumania is a sight to behold at times. From the moment 
The characters enter the quantum realm. The background of almost any scene seems to be something pulled from Reed's fever dreams. And while that doesn't always work in the film's favor, uh, the actors really interact with the background at times. Literally, there's a clear and visual impression of two people standing in front of a screen, a good bit of scenes in this movie. The praise must be still heaped on the visual effects team. The, the trip to the quantum realm, the most Isley Cantina-esque scene, the bevy of creatures found inhabiting the land, of many comparing the movie to Star Wars, I think, and rightfully so. It can't go overlooked that Peyton Reed unabashedly loves the Fantastic Four and actively worked on a film treatment for that long ago. And there's some scenes and ideas throughout that nod, I think, to his love of wacky space adventures. Uh, while the film's pacing is a bit problematic, especially in its shaky first act, once Kang is finally introduced, this when the story really settles into place. Once established, the second act shines as the film's highlight giving the story the feel of like a mad max beyond thunderdome painting parts of the quantum realm as this desolate wasteland completely unlike what we've you know what we've seen near the end of uh ant-man and the wasp the third act which is probably the weakest of the whole movie it, it enters absurd territory as scott fights to stop kang from enacting his nefarious schemes and Putting Paul Rudd up against Jonathan Majors makes sense in nobody's world. But overall, Quantumania, while still entertaining at times, lacks the magic of its predecessors, I think. The original spirit of the characters, the charm of Paul Rudd and the low stakes of the Ant-Man franchise are absent, leaves viewers with a bleaker tone and the lack of that goofy charisma they've come to expect. While Peyton Reed is still taking ambitious swings, a number of those ideas don't fully connect leaving the audiences with a story that doesn't fully live up to its potential. Uh, Rudd continues to be a delight. Jonathan Majors is appropriately menacing, and Catherine Newton, I think, is a pretty good addition, making the outcome of this project all the more baffling, really. Worth seeing on the biggest possible screen, thanks to some of the visual effects. Quantumania may leave some viewers continuing to question the overall quality of the post-endgame world we live in. Uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is in theaters now. If you're listening to this at the time it goes up, man, if you've seen it, let me know what you thought about it. If you haven't seen it yet, when you do, get back to me and let me know your thoughts. But that is it for this interview, man. And we'll be back for you down the road right here on Paprika.